startuprad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRadio.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the world's first internet radio station dedicated to startups and tech companies. Wherever you're watching this or listening to this, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. This time I do have a follow up interview because Back in the days in 2017, I did the world premiere, the first English interview of a newly founded all digital health insurer called Otto Nova. And since we have a lot to talk, so this episode is running a little bit longer than usual, more than 40 minutes. So guys, get a snack and get a beverage and enjoy the interview. This time I have the founder here after approximately four years to do a follow up. Hey, Roman, how are you doing? I'm great, and I'm happy to be here um, to follow up with this his story from four years ago. Well, I, I vividly remember that I said, hey, uh, let's do next year follow up. Well, <clears throat> it took <clears throat> four years, but nonetheless, we made a follow up, kept the promise. <laughs> so that's totally fine. Yeah, and that is typical for health insurance or insurance uh, as an industry. Uh, things take a bit longer uh, than in other industries, even when we do startup. Yeah. I'm totally sure we get to talk about this. Uh, first, we want to make one thing clear. You're not an insurtech company. You are a fully licensed health insurance company, meaning you take the risk on your own books and you're not an insurance broker or something, right? Absolutely. We're a full stack insurer uh, and we have digitized everything from acquisition to all the customer experience while you're on board, you know, and uh, everything is digital. And so in that respect, we are an intro tech. But uh, if you compare us with other intro techs who just take a, sp a specific part of the value chain, um, yes, we are um, a full stack health insurer with a, with a license, with a insurance and reinsurance license for Europe. Mm -hmm. Insurance and reinsurance, we may add that uh, insurance is a risk management business. There are specially qualified people who study insurance mathematics and then they try to minimize the risk. But nonetheless, all the insurers have to do some type of reinsurance. And at those reinsurance companies, the risk gets even more diversified across different insurance companies. Is this approximately correct? That is absolutely correct. So the interesting thing is that we ourselves are reinsured for catastrophic risk in our pool of, of, of lives. Um, but we are also have a reinsurance license ourselves. So, um, and I'm going to can, can talk about this later on. Uh, when we work in corporations and we do a white label corporation with another player, um, they can have the, uh, the risk in their books and we can take a reinsure out take, we can reinsure that risk. And so basically, in that case, you basically parcel out the, the business and, you know, every side takes 50% or another percentage. And, and that's a way to use uh, reinsurance also for white label business and insurance. Before we get into the real interview, I would be curious, what would be a catastrophic risk for what you are reinsured? Yeah, the typical case would be um, that... Somebody is insured with us, and he uh, and the person gets a baby, and um, and the baby has um, an extremely expensive rare disease. Um, so if somebody has an extremely expensive rare disease and once is knocking at our door, we have a, you know we can actually deny this person to enter the health insurance. So we check the risk, but with people who are born into our health insurance, so basically people who are born as kids of our insured uh, persons, um, they have the right to enter the health insurance right away. So in this case, you know, it could be a disease, a rare disease that will cost the insurance 200,000 euros a year. And for that risk, we are insured. So, so from a specific amount per year per person, we insure that risk with a reinsurer. Now, 
that does that happens very rarely, obviously. But if it would happen, it would uh, not be good for our risk pool, and so that's why we reinsure it. If you're big enough as a health insurance, and we're getting there, then you need less and less reinsurance because you basically uh, the whole pool will basically take care of the risk. And this reinsurance actually then um, is charged, I assume, until this kid is growing up. And then there are different regulations, how much you earn, what insurance you're going to take, and so on and so forth. But in Germany, you have to have some type of health insurance required by law, right? Yeah. So basically, our insured persons have the health insurance with us, and we reinsure a specific small part. So if if one person gets above a specific threshold of, of cost per year, we can then get that money back from the reinsurer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. It, fascinating stuff. Never dealt with it on startup rate that I owe before. But um, we're already deep in discussing what Autonova is. But let us first get you uh, get a little bit you personally introduced to our audience. As always, your LinkedIn profile is down here in the show notes and people can reach out to you directly. If they are looking for insurance, they would be better off looking at the company website. Of course, we also provide a link to there. And I saw you, you have a totally fascinating CV because you have been a platoon leader in the German army. Then you went on to study medicine, you were MD and a PhD in medicine. Then you became a consultant with uh, the guys like BBDO, AT Carney and McKinsey. And then you founded a startup. Can, can you take us along this fascinating journey? Absolutely. Well, when, when I finished high school in Germany, there was still the draft. So I decided instead of being bored in the army, I would take the a bit longer route to become an officer of the reserve. And uh, at the end of that, I was a platoon leader in the mountaineers. So at least yeah, I was doing ski tours in the mountains uh, and um, fun things in the mountains uh, while I was in the army. Um, be good. Uh, one question, are you still skiing? Absolutely, yeah, I'm still skiing. And uh, during uh, the COVID times, I took up cross-country skiing because uh, lifts were closed, you know, and um, Ski touring and cross-country skiing, I still love that. Yeah. If you live in Munich like I do, it's one of the classical things to do in the wintertime. Yeah. Yeah. And what I did learn, apart from skiing and, uh, and, uh, and ski touring, uh, what I did learn in the army was um, to lead. And that is obviously something that if you do a startup and are a CEO, it's something that is important for you. Um, I didn't need it in the, in the time in between too much. But uh, it came in handy when I started this startup. Um, after my time in the army, I studied medicine. I really loved that. Um, was totally engulfed in medicine, like everybody is, because it's like it's the most fascinating topic that you can study. I would argue, um, even having uh, having studied an M with an M economics afterwards with an MBA, um, and uh, I loved it. But I still felt maybe there's something else in life. Uh, so I did a um, internship at McKinsey and I loved that even more. And um, the, the, the core uh, of, of, the, of my change in career afterwards was really uh, the reason was that uh, I personally love to do new things. Innovation is my, is my thing and new things. And uh, you're a great physician if you've done the same thing over and over again now couple of thousand times. I mean, that's the physicians that I would look out for if I have a problem. Um, yeah, that's a medical practitioner. You practice, you practice, you repeat, you repeat, and you get better and better and better, right? And uh, this is not the perfect profile for a person like my, like me, who wants to do new things uh, and uh, develop, discover new things and, uh, and do this uh, discovery journey. And so that's much better in consulting because you get a new project all the time, right? And so you keep on learning, keep on learning, keep on learning. So I did a lot of consulting, um, learned a lot about the healthcare system because I only consulted in healthcare being a physician. And um, in, 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 the in the course of that, uh, you know, I started my first startup. Uh, after that, uh, what I've learned in consulting, then I said, you know, there's something we need to have better service in Germany. And uh, I started a demand and disease management company, basically a service company who does the service, the medical service uh, for health insurance. 
And um, we were like really pioneering this, this space in Germany and uh, basically had many of the leading insurer, insurers as customers. And the company still exists uh, in the new economy where we're quick, uh, quickly hyped and prepared an IPO, which we scrapped at the end of the new economy and quickly sold the pieces to Germany's largest uh, private payer at the time to DKV, which is part of the Munich Regroup. Um, and uh, I stayed there for two more years and learned a lot about how private health insurance works, but also learned that I didn't really like it. I liked, didn't like the way it worked at the time. Uh, and so I left again and I felt, um, what is it that I really need to do next in my life? And many people were reaching out. And one offer that I had was from BBDO Consulting, which is really a, a branding agency or a marketing agency uh, that wanted to do basically build up their own consulting business. And for me, that was the great chance to learn a lot more about marketing and sales and branding. Um, because I realized uh, in my first startup that this is the most important part. You can, you know, invent uh, and, and come up with a good idea, but if you can't market it, if you can't sell it, if you can't make it uh, interesting for for other parties, then you're not going to be successful. Um, so uh, I spent two years with BBDO uh, as a partner for their consulting practice. But really, um, I, you know, I helped them grow the business. But at the same time, I learned a lot. I learned from my uh, from my direct reports, who were much smarter than me uh, in branding and in marketing and sales. Obviously, I was much more experienced in healthcare. Um, so it was a good mixture, um, and uh, I learned a lot. But in the end, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and I don't want to work in somebody else's company. Uh, so I started my own consulting company and. Um, Ran that for 10 years, uh, looking for the next big thing that I could do uh, in the in the process, even organizing my own uh, conference, which was called Innovations and Investments in Healthcare. Uh, and I uh, had great speakers from the U.S. coming over there to Berlin to, in the Adlon Hotel and in the Soho House. We did the conference and it was great fun. Um, and I stayed on top of the latest development that way. Um, otherwise, you know, I might have uh, been, you know, buried deep down in work for pharma companies, uh, which uh, was, you know, good financially, but uh, doesn't give you, you know, the insight for the next startup to do. Um, so I also worked for um, some big startups who are doing big rounds now in healthcare, um, which I can still still cannot name. But um, so I was there in the space and I came up with the idea for Autonova to start a German digital health insurance, much like Oscar was at the time in the US. That was also my my advantage, that the investors knew Oscar and knew it was a success case. Um, several questions here. Uh, one would be, it's more than just a copycat of Oscar. And secondly, what was your importance, uh, your, your personal value? of Oscar, how did you perceive them and how important was it for you? As you said, the investors already knew them. Was this crucial to success of Oscar for Autonova? Yeah, and I didn't need Oscar for the idea, to be quite frank. So basically I had the idea uh, and built that up. And then I realized there's, well, there's, you know, there's something uh, in the US that is much bigger than that. So I had, I had thought about this for a long time because I was a frustrated innovators selling the innovations to health insurances. And so I, was, I had learned that you need to be the health insurance itself to be really innovative. It's pretty much like, like you know, in the computer space uh, where Apple said you need to have the software and the hardware to be really innovative. Uh, and the same experience was true for me uh, in health insurance. You need to have the services plus you need to have the relationship to the insured person. Otherwise, you can't really be 100% innovative. So I was looking for the opportunity. And then uh, when we, uh, when in my consultancy, you know, I had the advantage of, you know, using some of my, um, of my consultants uh, on the side to prepare this project. Um, uh, and we built up an idea that was pretty close to what Autonova is today. And then we saw that there was on the other side of the ocean, Oscar and there were brick success. And with 
knowing that, you know, then uh, while I worked for another startup trying to get financing for them, uh, some of the big investors in Germany were asking me, you know, can't we do something like Oscar in Germany? And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I, I do have a plan here in my pocket and I'm preparing that plan. And um, so it was a very lucky coincidence for me. And um, I th I do think that without having Oscar on the other side of the ocean, it would have been much more difficult to start Autonova, if not impossible. So I'm very grateful to Oscar for being there and um, for being a success story that uh, investors could see that there is a value in creating a health insurance. I see. And uh, what was what was the moment you actually decided, okay, now it is time? And I, I, I'm wondering um, how long it actually took you from like doing the first step, okay, now I'm going to launch this company, until you had the final license of the BaFin, meaning the German uh, oversight body for all things financial. They oversee the banks as well as the insurance companies. And if you want to provide insurance, you have to be licensed by them. In the beginning of 2015, uh, my now largest investor, uh, Hosping Venture, Christoph Jung, came into my office uh, with an idea that he wanted to check. And I told him it's never going to fly. Uh, and uh, he was kind of frustrated and said, but healthcare is so big, you know, but there must be something. And I said to him, you know, if you have balls, uh, you're going to start a real, your own health insurance. And then you can actually push all these levers. And uh, from that moment on, he was set on fire. And we are talking, we were talking all through the year 2015 about this idea and pushing it further and building it. And, uh, in the summer of 2015, we were basically looking for a management team. And I was interviewing some people, you know, who had, uh, come back from some other rocket ventures uh, and were basically, you know, not firm in health insurance and healthcare. And at the end of the summer, I told uh, to, uh, to Christoph, I said, you know, I think it's still a great idea, but the management that we're seeing here is not going to be the management that you need. You need somebody who understands insurance, who understands healthcare, who has an entrepreneur's mindset, you know, uh, and that's, uh, and uh, the, to have all these, um, to have all these points in one person was really difficult to find. And, um, as I have a very big ego, uh, or relatively big ego, I said, you know, the only person I know worldwide who, who ticks all the boxes, that's actually me, <laughs> you know? And, um, so we basically said, you know, okay, I probably will have to let my consultancy run by itself uh, and, and leave the company to do that. And, uh, so in the fall of 2015, uh, I was looking for two co-founders as uh, my investors said, well, you know, it's cool. You know, um, you're, you're 52. I think, I think it was 52 at the time. Uh, you're 52. And, um, that's not the typical startup age, really. You know, and I said, well, you know, that's why I'm ticking all the boxes, you know, because I have all that experience. And they said, but we still need a great CTO, you know, who's worked at Rocket and, uh, we need, uh, a great guy for design and for the product. Um, and I said, you know, what, what, what's, you know, where, where, where do you think this person should come from? And I said, well, you know, um, uh, Wunderlist was just sold, you know, maybe if you can get uh, the designer of Wunderlist, that would be great. And I said, okay, so Rocket Wunderlist, get it. So, uh, we went out there with my consulting team and talked to, um, talked to great candidates in the market. And I went to Berlin and met them and, um, they all saw, they saw right away what a great opportunity this was. And so Frank Bertzle from Rocket and uh, Sebastian Scherer from Wunderlist, um, basically, uh, said, you know, they're going to participate. They were becoming my co-founders. And in December of 2015, so at the end of the year, beginning of the year, the idea started at the end of the year, uh, we started the company. Um, and, uh, I think they had the financing round, the final, uh, the first financing round with Holzbring Ventures. The final um, st stop was basically uh, the 23rd of December uh, at, at midnight. So I really wanted to get home for Christmas. And so uh, we got the last points cleared out of the way. And um, so started the company. Officially, it always says, you know, the company was started in 2015. But uh, operations really started in January of 2016. Obviously. And then um, I, my 
consultancy, you know, I made my, my best consultants. I made them uh, see co-CEOs of the company and um, let them run it. Uh, later on, a couple of years later, I sold the consultancy um, uh, to a larger consultancy, which made sense because basically um, I was not there anymore to procure the sales, you know, and uh, then, they, then they were lacking critical mass uh, in some ways. And so, so we sold, in the end, I sold off the consultancy, but a couple of years later. Um, and uh, so we started the company in 2006, uh, 2016 in the January, and we wouldn't have started it if I hadn't had, hadn't, uh, to have talked to BaFin, the regulatory agency in Germany, uh, at the end of 2015, and you know, said, you know, is there a chance that you will let me through? And they said, well, yes, we actually would welcome a new entrant into, into the market. Uh, we can't let too many companies in because obviously, uh, if you are a private health insurance in Germany, you live forever because they don't want you to go broke. And um, because you have the savings more or less of, of your insured persons because they pay more when they're young and we use that money to pay their bills when they're old. Um, but we need innovation from time to time. So every, you know, 20 years roughly or 17 years in our case, uh, they will uh, let a new entrant into the market, you know, to get some competition. It's, it's certainly time now because uh, dig digitization is coming, you know, we have to do something about that. And um, so they let us enter the market, also asked us um, to um, to have a, a structure where we could also sell some of our services to other health insurers, and which we have is like our B2B leg of the business. And um, from start, you know, from starting in 2017 uh, and 2016 in January, it took us one and a half years until 21st of June of 2017 when we could launch the company. Um, we never knew, you know, whether when we would get the license, you know, because they always said, you know, when when everything is perfect, you know, we will give you the license, but we still need A, B, C, and D. So over time, we built up our system, we built up the company, and you have to imagine it. It's a little bit like um, if you have an ocean liner sitting in the harbor of Frank of, of Hamburg. Uh, and they will give you the license to get patients uh, to, to get to deliver uh, to deliver passenger, passengers across the ocean, uh, but they will check your your ocean liner. They will enter the restaurant and they will try to taste the menu and they will see how the machines are working. And when all of this is working, they will allow you to tell the person get the screws if if they're tight. Yes, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> And that's, that's how they work. And, and, and it is understandable because uh, they are protecting the customers in the end. And, uh, but it does mean that you have to front a lot of money. Uh, we had to front 40 million euro, basically. Um, uh, you had to get 40 million euros from the, uh, from our investors before we were able to, to launch the company, you know, and then we needed some money afterwards. Um, currently the Bafin is getting even stricter. They say, we have seen that, you know, um, even when we, you know, see the first business plan that, you know, later on the startups always find out that they will need more money in the all, uh, after all. Uh, I think, you know, every startup can f knows this feeling, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Every startup not knows always, this. Oh, we could use a little bit more money here and a little bit more money there. Maybe one or two employees here in sales and marketing and that kind of adds up over time. The investors right? do know that and they, uh, you know, the prof professional investors and so they you know, have consecutive rounds and everything. The BaFin is more in the mindset of, you know, we want to have it financed through. Um, so, it's actually even harder now to start an insurance or insure tech in Germany than it was at the time when we started. So we were lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. When I was looking at your profile on Crunchbase, I saw that you're currently on Series D and raised a total of approximately 85 million euros. And you hinted, well, it's not mostly up to date, but it's approximately right. Yeah, we. Uh, I think in the meantime, we have raised a little bit more. Um, we don't always report all the financing rounds right away. Um, so we, you know, basically it's, it's not a most important thing for us uh, to report. Oh, now we've done another financing round. So we report them from time to time. And, um, so usually, uh, if you look at Crunchbase, uh, we, the, it's, I think it's correct to say that, uh, we usually have raised a little bit more money than you can see at Crunchbase. 
but over time it will correct yeah over time it will correct that's great and now we talked through um how you started up uh where, where you at right now uh approximately three to four years after the start of Autonova, what of your assumption of running this business turned out to be true and what turned out to be wrong? Um, yeah, we, I think, let me start out with what assumption turned out to be. Oh, yeah. Well, I think there's like one assumption that turned out to be true, one that turned out to be wrong, and another one that, uh, what we learned about it. So what, uh, what turned about sure. to be true was the assumption that People, you know, in our case, uh, between the age of 30 and 35, who are making this lifetime decision for health insurance, they want an experience like they have at Amazon and uh, at, Apple, at Apple. This is something they want. They don't find this at the current health insurers. And uh, um, we, we may add for our audience here that usually you're insured by what we call um Gesetzliche Krankenversicherung, it's the legal insurance company. So there, there are insurance companies out there that just have to take you if you have an income or no income and you, and you pass a certain threshold or when you're an entrepreneur or when you work, uh, independently freelancing stuff like this, there are certain rules when you can get private insurance. But usually if you're working somewhere, you have to pass over a certain amount, a certain threshold, a certain time in order just to qualify for private health insurance. That's why you're talking about 30 to 35. Absolutely. Right? That's the reason why. And this is the, you know, the, the, the age bracket in which we are getting our new lives and which we are addressing. And, um, and we were right about this and we were right about this that, that a digital product where we can get a lot of support and real time information to the insured person, uh, will create that great uh, customer experience. And, you know, I can tell you now that we have a net, perform a net performance, uh, uh, NPS, net performance score, um, net promoter score uh, of 70, while the industry average is 14. So we are like far above uh, the crowd. Uh, and really on par with Apple and Amazon. So that, uh, that is something, uh, that turned out to be true. Uh, and we were right about that. Um, we made an initial mistake that we could correct over time. And that initial mistake, uh, uh there's an old saying in industry that, uh, in the insurance industry that says insurance is, uh, sold, not bought. And we basically, uh, meaning that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know, today I'm going to buy health insurance. Um, and uh, that this is a, the reason why there is a very good business for brokers who make a lot of money on, you know, visiting you at your home and basically telling you uh, where to sign which kind of paper. Um, Actually, if I would have not been working during my national service in the medical field as an EMT, I would have never thought about health insurance i think that, that that's a topic you're talking about because i had a new job i was passing the threshold and i was looking at private health insurance and actually it's it's i do believe it's not that frequently that somebody really realizes oh i could do that well let's work out the details let's look for the best best health insurance company out there right? absolutely and that's why uh, we are Initial idea was uh, we will start and only sell in the in the direct channel, and we were not going to have uh, any commissions into the in the tariff, and because of that we will not be listed at comparison websites like Check24 in Germany, um, and um, but we don't care because uh, we have the best tariff and people will find out about it and will love it, and the, the good news is that even the Great company Lemonade from the US made the same mistake when launching in Germany. Um, did the same thing and they didn't sell too much. Uh, we didn't sell too much because the German would go, a typical German will go on the Check24 comparison website and will see whether the tariff that you're trying to sell him actually how it compares to others. And Check24 will only let you on there uh, if you're, uh, if you pay them a commission and if they can sell your product. And so, uh, so what we learned is, we're not strong enough. Our brand is not strong enough uh, in the beginning, just because we have the superior product. Um, we also have to have superior sales. And um, 
That's why we added commissions into our tariffs. We listed on the comparison websites. Uh, we added uh, Pro 7 z 1 Group as an investor and got a media for equity package there so that we could um, increase the strength of our brand via TV uh, advertisements. And um, with that, um, we actually started growing very strongly. So that was the, the mistake that we made was just purely focus on the direct channel. We still uh, have a very good business on the direct channel, especially in the full health insurance. Uh, in the supplemental health insurance, we sell a lot about uh, that lot through partner websites. And the latest development uh, on that in that area was that we also started now with what I was talking about at the beginning about with white label corporations, uh, where we have partners, uh, sales partners who are basically selling the tariff under their own name. Uh, and they're very happy that, you know, they have a great tariff uh, with a great customer experience with the best in the promoter score in the, mo in the market. Um, and we're basically sharing uh, the, the income from, the, from, this, uh, from this tariff. And that way, we have many more uh, avenues to the market and many more sales channels. And that is bringing us a strong growth in the market. We're still, we're still in the direct channel. We're still very transparent uh, and we're still using that, but we have to, ha we had to have, we had to adapt to the German market uh, specificities. Uh, and um, that is, that has actually worked very well for us. I also want to add that uh, what you're referring to tariffs is actually Americans would refer to it as insurance plans. And I think just a few American listeners just said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so so we have to bridge the um, we have to bridge. Yeah, the, actually, uh, if you compare here. us to the so, US market, uh, the strange thing in Germany is or the, the different thing is that uh, once you make a choice for a health plan, you usually stay there for life. It makes sense the first few years you can still switch if you're not happy with the uh, with your customer experience. Um, but after after a certain period of time, I would say roughly seven years, uh, it's just economically not not a good idea to switch because you build reserves at your health plan and you lose them when you switch. And that's the specific thing in Germany. That's why we have a very big customer lifetime value. And when I was still a consultant, uh, I also worked for a company who sold risk life insurance, um, you know, which is not a big product, but it's a good product, additional product to have, but not a good product in itself. And they bought their, they bought the, the traffic very dearly. And then they had a very small customer lifetime value that didn't make any sense. While for us, we have a very high customer lifetime value. And even with a relatively high customer acquisition cost, our, um, our ratio, you know, of lifetime value to, to customer acquisition costs is much better than all, and all the other businesses that I know. So, um, health insurance is a business that lends itself much better to actually to direct selling. Nevertheless, as you need the, uh, the trust factor in the market, you need to build up your brand and you need to have sales partnerships with other partners in the market who can actually uh, get their trust across, you know, and that's why we're even working together with broker groups um, because they can actually tell the, the person that, that is interested in our tariff, in our health plan, yes, Autonova is a good company, you will be happy with them. And um, that is important for us. And that's what we learned. Even though you're insured by uh, your alpha side, your insurance, everything is regulated by Bafin, people still need this branding aspect. Um, I was I was curious, what are your uh, two questions? First, uh, you said you got a media deal from Pro7 Sat1, their private TV station based in Munich down there. They run some of the privately owned uh, TV stations here in Germany, the bigger, some of the bigger ones. And, um, personally, I experienced that I watch less and less and less linear TV, as it is called, since I do have the usual streaming apps on my TV. So, uh, one question would be, how did you also see, not like in terms of numbers, but like in, uh, did you also see a decline of the importance of TV as a marketing channel here in Germany? 
Yeah. That was the surprising thing for myself because at the beginning of the Autonova voyage, uh, I was even quoted as saying, you know, we're not going to do TV commercials, you know, uh, we are going to be on Facebook, uh, Google, whatever. Um, the answer is what we've learned is you need to do both, so simply spoken. And the power of TV is still much bigger than we all think. So, um, uh, especially, by the way, during COVID times, everybody was watching TV, linear TV. And uh, now, uh, personally, I was, I'm, I'm like you, I would say, you know, well, I have uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney at home. So, you know, I'm not going to watch, um, I'm not going to watch free TV. I did watch free TV yesterday night, obviously for the for the Euro, Euro Cup. <laughs> yeah. Cup, but um, so so this is the thing that we say, you know, I'm not going to watch free TV, but then I do watch free TV there and there, and um, and yeah, and there are still, especially the young people. It's fascinating to me also. There are some um, specific, and you know, you can obviously you don't go for every kind of show, but there are some shows that still have a very good viewership in the 30 to 35 years bracket. Um, and also good people with good buying power. And, um, so, uh, uh, it is, so we all, we're all thinking in the future. We're saying, you know, again, 10 years, not what it's going to watch television anymore. Um, but, uh, as of today, people still are, and it's a great branding instrument and it still works much better than most of us that we are kind of living in the future still believe. That was one of my learnings, you know. And obviously, you have to couple that. You know, it's like it's not enough to be on TV. Um, you have to be uh, on Instagram as well. Um, but the mix, basically, you have to be on different on different channels, and you have to mix it. And um, so, my surprise was uh, how good TV is actually working. Yeah. And admittedly, I've seen some ads for Autonova just digital, like talk about Facebook, Google ads and stuff like this, but you've never reached me on TV personally. Sorry, YouTube is a good channel for us, you know, so, so like one, you know, that you could see the same ad on television uh, or, you know, a variation of the ad on YouTube. And um, so, so we, so you, you, you mix that's, I think that's, the, that, that's the real secret. Uh, but I was surprised myself. I, I came in with the same mentality of, you know, television is over and why don't, why do we do this at all? Um, but it did make a lot of sense for us. And it, uh, during COVID times, it was, it was spectacular. Uh, talking about COVID, one of the questions I meant to ask you was how did Corona impacted you? I assume you're an all digital health insurance company. Have you been prepared to work? all remote and that you also see a change in the behavior of your let's say potential customers and customers yeah so that's like different parts of covid that uh, that changed us so one thing was um we were uh, after two weeks we were all remote you know that was easy for us you know it's easy when you start a new company and uh, and you're doing uh, video conferences anyway and you have zoom installed and everybody has a laptop i mean so it was much easier for us than for for the incumbent companies obviously um, but i think that's probably true for all the startups um the other thing is um what does it do to the business so for the business it was on one hand it was actually good for us because you know digitization was was uh, getting into it uh, was basically um, accelerated uh, across all the different areas and uh, it was much more normal to buy something online even health insurance than it was before and our competition couldn't even go and come and visit people in their homes um, there's a little effect for the first few months when basically um, uh, uh, the, the financing dried up and everybody was afraid, you know, and that was kind of bad for us. We didn't like that. Uh, but then after a couple of months, uh, everybody saw, okay, this is going to be over in some time. And also that we are actually profiting in some ways from it. I don't, I wouldn't want to say that really in, in, uh, profit, but uh, that it was helpful for us. Uh, and um, people, for one, people saw the importance of health insurance. What, what you learned in your, in your job as in, in the ER department. Um, and uh, people saw that that was important. People realized they could do anything, uh, with their mobile phone, you know, and, uh, and digitally. 
and uh, people uh, were willing and uh, interested in, in some some things that we had pioneered in Germany, like uh, like telehealth, you know. Um, but as everything in life, there's always a balance. Um, uh, as I told you before, we need this uh, trust. It's very important for us. And when people are worried about the future, um, the trust factor is a little bit of a problem. So we saw whenever well, there was a strict lockdown um, that... Uh, Business was a bit slower than usual, but the moment that the lockdown was then released, uh, business was even better than before. Um, so, so it was in general, you know, to be a complicated answer in general, it was helpful for us and it um, helped us our positioning as well. Um, the strict lockdown itself, you know, those weeks of the strict lockdown were something where our sales numbers wouldn't go up as much as in the, in the rest of the year. Um, that we are running already a little bit longer than the usual interview, as we said before, but nonetheless, I find this interview fascinating. And there's uh, just one more question on my usual repertoire that I have to ask. Are you guys open to talk to potential new investors? Sorry, are we guys open to talk to potential new investors? Yes, um, I think... Yeah, the short answer is yes, um, <laughs> which startup is not. Um, we are moving now from the venture capital area to the growth equity area. And um, towards the end of the year, uh, we will start some new talks. Um, for us, raising, you know, we have the ability to deploy large amounts of capital because we basically buy the customers upfront, you know, and monetize them over a long period of time. And there are some ways, uh, it's, it's a very safe cash flow that we're generating. And um, it will, uh, there, there is the possibility to deploy large capital, large amounts of capital, but it's not necessary. So um, we are actually at a very good uh, juncture right now. And so we're talking to different groups. Uh, we'll, we will be talking uh, at the end of the year to different groups. Um, and uh, I think uh, we will probably be able to get to the next uh, level of, of growth through that. Um, so yes, um, uh, we will. We are open to talking to new investors, especially from the growth equity scene. Mm -hmm. Well, only thing left for me to say right now would be best of luck for your new adventures, and um, hopefully we catch up. Let's say in four years again. Absolutely, Joe. <laughs> and I hope I can tell you many interesting things in, the, uh, in those four years again. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.eo podcast or check for the StartupRad.eo internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.eo skill as well.